Good morning everybody, uh, my name is Sophia Casbolt and I work as a research coordinator at Cure Brain Cancer Foundation. Um, brain cancer is a really devastating disease and Cure Brain Cancer is working to try and improve patient outcomes. My, my job isn't exactly one that I expected to be in uh, when I was at high school or actually even just a couple of years ago, but um, I've really enjoyed the experience and I'm really looking forward to what comes next. One thing I've learnt is that everybody sees the world differently and everybody has their own creativity and both of these things mean that you add something to whatever you do in your life as well as whatever you do in your career. And I found that an unexpected way for me was in science. I found that science, and sci particularly science communications, has given me an unexpected way to um, unleash my creativity and problem solve. I'm lucky that my job as a research coordinator not only lets me write about science for a mass audience, but it also means that I've learnt skills outside of science, including in marketing, as well as conducting interviews, and contracting and even some event management. I, um, I didn't actually start out wanting to work in science. When I was at school, I didn't really you know, like science that much and I thought maybe I wanted to be a designer or a photographer. Scientists, science actually has been in my life since I was a kid as my dad was trained as a chemist. He, it always helped in making candy and helping in recipes when I didn't know what to substitute. But I never really thought of these as science. It took quite a while for me to understand that this was the practical element and everything. Um, as I said, I wasn't that interested in science in high school. I, I preferred art and art history, and when I left school, I actually studied these at uni. I wasn't really sure how they'd lead to a job, though. So after a year of that, I actually quit uni um, to try and figure out more what I wanted to do for a career. Um, during uni, I'd done temp work, and I continued to do this when I left uni. I worked in all different kinds of businesses across different industries, including like pharmaceutical companies and healthcare, and I worked as mostly in admin and as a receptionist. I quite enjoyed working as a receptionist. I got to meet lots of people, and I really enjoyed the pharma and healthcare industry as well. But after a year of that, I decided that I wanted to try something different, and so I went back to uni. A friend of mine had actually started studying social science and I found what he was learning really interesting. So when I went back to uni, I studied sociology, cultural studies and anthropology. They're all kind of classed as social science and they look at how people interact with each other and with the world around themselves. I took classes in all of the areas, but I decided that actually anthropology was my favorite. Now, Whilst considering how people interact with each other, I kind of felt like there was this massive hole in what people were talking about, and that was science, and how people actually, how, this, how the world actually works. And I realised that science and technology actually play, had a huge influence on people's lives and how they lived and interacted with each other. Um, so I decided that I needed to understand science better. So after some a little bit confused conversations with some science lecturers who weren't really sure why I wanted to do a chemistry degree after having not done it in high school, um, I convinced them that chemistry was actually the most practical for me and I would actually really enjoy doing it. And then they were always supportive after that. <laughs> um, I also actually remember doing hi high school chemistry and the practical classes were always the most fun. You got to change colours and light things on fire. Now, don't get me wrong, chemistry at uni wasn't the easiest thing for me to do. I, I found it quite difficult, but I always found that I could find help from new friends or from lecturers or even lab technicians. And I actually used a lot of online videos as well. And the practical classes were really fun. I found that there was always somebody to help you and also that I was willing to work that bit harder if it was something that I enjoyed or something that I had made a goal for. I also learnt that it was a lot better to ask questions than just wonder why I didn't get something. During my degree, I got the opportunity to go to high schools and, and teach kids science. I really, and, and um, help facilitate science days. Um, and I really enjoyed chemistry and I found it really creative at uni. So I quite enjoyed seeing high school kids interact with chemistry in this way. 
In my last year and a half of my five years at uni, I discovered that Macquarie was running science communications classes. I'd never heard of these before and I didn't even know that it was an industry. But when I started learning about it, I realised that this was the gap, that, that the bridge that actually get, you know, bridged the gap between science and humanities that I'd felt earlier. Science communications is about taking the complexity and jargon of science and turning it into plain everyday language so that everyone can understand what science is, is, is about. Every discipline has their own jargon, specific words that mean something only to those who work or are involved in the area. For example, a non-cricketing country, they would have no idea what out for a duck meant. And science is the same. And even within science, chemistry, biology, physics, they all have their own jargon, their own terminology that they use to describe things. I wanted to know if anybody has heard of Veritasium or I effing love science. They're all really amazing examples of science communication and they're all made for a young audience. They're, um, I, I guess that you like things that are short and snappy and also that have a lot of information and are re really interesting and relevant to your life. Well, these, these are examples of science communications that do just that. People these days, they want inf their information short, in biteable snacks, and science communications is all about doing that for science. When you are communicating science, or anything for that matter, it's really important to remember who you're talking to, who you're communicating with. And it's also important to remember to tell it in a story. When I was doing science communications at uni, we had this guy come and talk to us called Randy Olson. He was a hard out researcher and then decided to move to Hollywood, take acting classes and actually make a video about science. He also wrote a book called Don't Be Such a Scientist. I, um, after this presentation, a few weeks later I had to write a blog post for my class and you know I actually wasn't really sure that I'd remember anything that he said. But one of his take home messages I'm telling you now and I still remember it today and that was to tell it in a story. People remember people and people remember stories. They don't really remember facts. And it's always important to remember that when you're communicating, and particularly in science. When you talk to a different audience, you say things in a different way. For example, if you spoke Italian and you were speaking to somebody in Danish, they, you know, they would have no idea what you're talking about unless they also speak Italian. In my last year of uni, as part of my science communications class, I got the opportunity to do an internship at the Australian Museum. And I really would encourage anyone who has the opportunity to do an internship or work experience in any way to do it. It's an amazing experience. You learn so much by being in a workplace. Even though you do little odds and ends, you actually get to participate and you get to see what people do every day. Apart from anything else, it's great to talk about in job interviews. You can use your experience in internships to show that you have practical experience in what you're trying to get a job in. During my internship, I was lucky enough to actually help um, with a program called Scientist for a Day, and we did an environmental science class for school-aged children. And all of this, I also actually got to demonstrate chemistry during National Science Week, and all of these things have actually continued to be useful in my job now. I finished uni at the beginning of 2013, and I decided that I wanted to pursue a career in science communications. I didn't exactly know in what way I was going to make this happen, but I knew that I wanted to incorporate the skills that I'd learnt into a career. I thought about maybe working for a science magazine or um, through a university or a museum teaching kids science, or even through a pharmaceutical or biotechnology company. But um, with all these great dreams, what I ended up doing was actually temp work again. This time I focused on working though in the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry because it was the industry that I'd liked the most when I was temping before and I decided that I wanted to see a little bit more what it was like on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd also decided to save up and go travelling. I also ended up, just before I left, working in a recruitment company and that taught me a very valuable lesson in that I don't want to work in recruitment. So I went travelling to the States and I came back and um, I was fortunate enough to be told about a research coordinator position at Cure Brain Cancer Foundation. I actually hadn't really thought about working in a charity 
it didn't really seem to be what I thought about in terms of science or science communications. But it looked like a really interesting job and an amazing opportunity. Um, it can be really difficult to get a job right out of uni and I was really incredibly fortunate to be offered this opportunity not that long after being out of uni. I found that enthusiasm, drive and also transferable skills can really go a long way and I've been at Kill Brain Cancer now for over a year and a half. Kill Brain Cancer though isn't a traditional charity. They do things differently. And also when you say you work in science, people generally expect a lab coat rather than an office job. But it can be both. I also learned to use science and science communications in a different way. My day-to-day -day role involves staying on top of um, brain cancer research internationally and looking at all of the things that are different between regular brain cells and brain cancer cells, as well as all the new treatments that are coming up for patients. I get to work with some brilliant scientists and also learn about the research that they do every day. Last year we ran a grants round um, at Cure Brain Cancer to help fund brain cancer research across Australia. One of my responsibilities in my job is the grant administration and making sure the contracting is set with the universities and the foundation for all the projects that we run at the universities. I also keep track of all of the reporting and invoicing of the projects. Um, I'd like to actually show you a video um, of some of the researchers in Australia talking about the research that they do and the grants round that we ran last year. As a young scientist, brain cancer is, is the final frontier. There, is, there are a lot of opportunities for new discoveries, new innovations, and the mountain that we have to climb is, is huge. For me, as somebody who's always tried to push boundaries, that's, that's, that's why I got into science. That is an exciting opportunity. I think most of the applications have been very good. We obviously can't grant uh, to everybody, but I think we've been pretty careful about being transparent, making clear decisions, basing it on the science, basing it on opportunity, and basing it on really the foundation's uh, view about trying to improve the care of cancer patients, brain cancer patients. Our project is um, really to try and discover a biomarker for brain cancer, which um, a biomarker is something, can be any kind of test, it can be a, a tumour sample or in, in our case a blood sample, uh, that helps us to understand the tumour better and its behaviour better. This antibody has been uh, created to specifically attack a cancer protein. It's one that we think is restricted to the cancer cell that will kill it, but not the normal cells. So, and we, we've already had some experience in people to say it's safe. So it has all the characteristics of a great anti-cancer drug. We know our cell function is determined by our genetic content materials. But on top of our genetic material is what we call the epigenetic code. Uh, we want to use the genetic engineering to create cells, normal cells that carry um, this mutation or H3.3 and ATRX and understand how this could start the changes in epigenetic codes and how that may drive cancer in the beginning. We know that radiation is effective in treating brain cancer, but unfortunately the cancer comes back in most of the patients. So by adding this drug to the radiation, we uh, are hoping to improve uh, the outcome of patients by increasing the damage to the tumor. We've developed an antibody which targets GBM in patients. What we want to do is try and understand better which patients will respond best to treatment, but in particular in patients that respond but then may relapse, why they relapse so that we can improve the treatment and get better outcomes. I'm a strong believer in the fact that we cannot treat all patients the same and especially with brain tumours. Every single tumour that we see is completely different. So there's a, um, a target in brain cancer, a potential target, called EGFR. And in other cancers, particularly lung cancers, when that's altered or mutated, you can target that um, protein EGFR with drugs. And those patients actually respond and they can actually go into remission for 12 months, maybe even two years. In brain cancer, when you treat the patients with these compounds, they don't respond at all. And so this project is around trying to understand why they don't respond, and then maybe what we can combine these EGFR drugs 
with to make them more responsive and effective in brain cancer patients? Things have accelerated a lot in the last uh, couple of years. I think we have a, um, a much better understanding of the, uh, the human genome now. And we have, we now, you know, for the first time in history, have technology that can actually screen the whole genome and can do this kind of project. So we can screen you know, hundreds or thousands of genes in just a few hours for about you know, a thousand dollars. Whereas just five years ago, that was almost impossible. So um, it really is technology driven, a lot of the research. We're aiming to develop um, a molecular imaging platform based on targeting the FA2 receptor. What we envisage is, is something like a personalised medicine approach, um, whereby a patient would, would, who presented with a brain tumour would, would go in uh, and we would take an image with, a, with our imaging agent and we would use that to decide on whether that patient is a, a strong candidate for a particular targeted therapy or not. I thought that the quality of the presentations was amazing. Um, things have come out of the woodwork that I never knew existed um, and I think it's a very exciting time for neuro-oncology research in Australia. One person can't be everything so I think we need a group like this to assess grant applications, make decisions, work out what's best for our patients and our community and I think that's exactly what we, we're doing at this table. We're making sure that we've got the expertise around the table to make transparent, careful, considered and appropriate decisions. I think there's a role for everyone. Um, science for the clinical studies which are done by our expert clinicians. Pharmaceutical companies which are responsible for funding the very large and expensive clinical trials. Uh, but also other funding sources to understand the science such as the Cure Brain Cancer Foundation play an incredibly important role. Those are scientists that tackle brain cancer every day and look at details smaller than cells. They're discovering ways that brain cancer works and also how to treat it. They do science in a very different way than I do, but I get to help communicate the amazing work that they do every day to, a base of our, to the base of our supporters and also to the general public through our website and through blogs. I contribute to Cure Brain Cancer's research blog and I also help with the science-based content and statistics for the website. I've also been helping design and implement a new communications program called Brilliant Minds. It's for young researchers and students um, to help facilitate brain cancer research and also cross collaboration between different, um, different types of research and also within the field of brain cancer. Every day at Cure Brain Cancer is different and I get to work closely with all of the teams there. Research really is fundamental to what we do, so I get an insight into everything, from fundraising to marketing and events and engagement. Even at our annual ball, I've met some pretty amazing celebrities. I've met Charlie Teo, the famous neurosurgeon, Pat McCutcheon, the Waratah, the Governor General, and also people like Richard Wilkins, the TV personality. I've attended some excellent scientific conferences as well, and I've also met some international scientists that are just brilliant. Um, I've also, quite embarrassingly, as you can see from that picture, got to model our beautiful brain cancer beanie. <laughs> None of these things I would have expected would be part of a science role, and I've been extremely lucky and have had some really amazing and unexpected opportunities. In the first few months of starting my job, I learned about brain cancer, because I didn't know very much about it. I also learned where to find brain cancer statistics and collated them all for our website. I also started organising and planning and actually ended up running a, an event for brain cancer patients. None of these things I really had experience with before I started my job, but I took on the challenge and I ended up getting through it. I also got to use my skills in a new way. In my job, I see all sides of brain cancer, and I actually also regularly take calls from brain cancer patients. I see the phenomenal research that brain cancer researchers are doing to help improve the outcomes for these people. Earlier, I spoke about how at uni I felt that there was a, a you know, science was vital to discussions around humanities and that there was some sort of gap there. Well, seeing all angles of brain cancer like this, I actually get to see the humanity in science as well. There are so many aspects and avenues to working in science, and I would encourage you to try them. Something I learned in studying science and also working in the industry is that thinking outside the box and being creative in your work not only makes it more fun, 
but it is also an essential element to problem solving, and also science generally. It also applies to what you think you might want to do with a career. Try something. If it isn't what you think it was going to be, that's probably, that's probably correct because most things aren't. But you never know unless you try. And you know what? You might actually enjoy it. You might find that it's something you're good at that you didn't expect. And if it isn't, and if you don't like it, then that's fine too. At least you gave it a go. Both of these situations I've been in before and I've learnt a lot for both of them. If you've always known what you wanted to do as your career, that's awesome. And I'm so, you know, so pleased. But I actually didn't. I had no idea what I wanted to do and it's taken me a long time to figure out the things that I enjoy and that I uh, am somewhat good at. <laughs> all I know is that I, all I ever knew was that I wanted to contribute to the world in some way and also that I liked a bit of a challenge. These are things that aren't industry specific. They span across all different sorts of jobs and all different sorts of industries. And realistically, your interests and your skills often change over time. So it makes sense that your career might as well. Much like science, I found that for me, um, what I wanted to do was about trial and error. And it's also about learning from what you've done before. I didn't think that I'd be doing this job or using science and communication skills in the way that I do. It's definitely been um, a creative approach for me in terms of looking at my career path. So um, I'd like to thank you for listening to my story and any questions that anybody has, please ask. Nine years. <laughs> I, I graduated high school in 2006 and um, I started uni and I did a year and then took a year off and in total I did five years of a degree because I did a double degree. So I, I did arts and science. I don't know that I'm um, actually qualified to answer that properly but I would, I would just go and ask your careers advisor and also, if you're interested in any unis in particular, I'd go and ask them what, what's the best avenue to get into um, to become a paramedic. Well, I guess there's quite a range and it, it really it depends on what, what you want to take out of the degrees that you did. So I, I did a chemistry degree and I did an anthropology degree. Um, so, I mean, in terms of a science career, you could do anything from research to working in science communications to working in grants administration. Um, it depends what industry you're interested in as well. Like, I quite like the not-for-profit space, so there's a lot of opportunities there in terms of um, even, even, you know, doing research strategy and that sort of thing and, and sort of helping choose what projects to to fund, um, but I think it's it's one of those things that I wasn't really sure about either, and I was really interested in potentially working for a science magazine and doing um, science writing like that, um, or I quite like teaching um, small kids as well, so the museum science programs are really interesting to me, um, and they're kind of using science in a little bit of a different way, but. Um, yeah, I guess it depends on what aspect of science that you're interested in. There's, there's a lot of opportunities that are kind of a little bit out of the box. So you just have to kind of pick the skills that you're more interested in, um, whether it's writing or talking to people or strategy or actually in a lab, um, and then just sort of follow that. I had an amazing opportunity actually to go to a scientific meeting that Cure Brain Cancer ran last year and I, I helped organise the day but I also got to meet like really top brain cancer researchers and doctors from around the world and not only meet them and say oh hi it's very nice to meet you, I actually got to sit next to them and have a chat with them about how they got to where they were and um, what they did and, and talk about um, how they saw where things were going and all this sort of thing. And I think that that was um, quite a highlight for me because 
I got to see these people in a different light as well. You know, they get up and they talk about this amazing science that they're doing and it's really complex and intricate and fascinating. But they're actually um, quite normal people as well and they can just have a chat and it's, it's really interesting to see how they all got to where they are as well. Um, so I think that was probably a highlight for me. I studied anthropology as my arts degree um, and I think part of that has come through in, in, in my science communications because it's about understanding people and it's about understanding what people are interested in and what people want to hear and how they want to hear it. And I think that that's actually really helped in terms of um, how to write science and how to get science across to people um, in a way that they'll enjoy as well as find interesting. So yeah, I think that that's helped. <laughs>